Okay. Well, welcome to this week's discussion of the uh, Torah portions. This week we're going to touch a little bit on last week's, which was Bamidbar, and dive into the bulk of Nasso. And I am joined here by our friend Hello. Grant Luton. Hello, Grant. Hi, Tim. It's good to be back. Good. This time I wore the shirt. You wore the I shirt? knew you wouldn't yeah. wear it two weeks in a row, so <laughs> okay. I thought I'd be safe wearing this is the our, shirt. This is our new tradition. I'll no. wear it next week. It's next not the week exact is... same shirt. I mean, we have, we have oh, our sorry. own shirt. But... Oh, yeah. okay. Anyway. But they're very close. They are very close. Very close. <clears throat> okay, so why don't, right. we, why, don't you, um, why don't you go ahead and start us off with some things you want to draw out from the Midbar. Sure. If you would. Um, to me, one of the most important things about uh, these censuses, and that is the plural of census, I had to look that up this morning to make sure, is that you have a census here at the beginning of the book of Numbers, and this is why it's called Numbers, and then you have another one near the end of the book over in chapter 24. And I find it fascinating to compare the two totals. So here in chapter 1, verse 46, we find the total number of Israelites not including Levi, of course, is 603,550. Then when you go over to chapter 24, verse 51, the total drops to 601,730. In between these two censuses, a lot of death is happening. And that is really the main thing that happens in the book of Numbers. If I can just jump for a second... It just hit me this week as I was reading this. I've been thinking about these people. They built the tabernacle. They have the census. They have the, the Levites all set up. They have the sacrificial system in place. They've, they're getting now these final instructions concerning the wayward woman and the Nazarite and, and the tribal leaders bring their gifts. And everything is just like everything's put in place for this big trip they're about to take. And they're all going to fail. They're all going to die. They're not going to make it. For 40 years, this generation that we've read all these things about, they fail, they die, except for Joshua and Caleb. Those are the only two. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a real lesson to me because we can look back at how far we've come. But until we die, our journey's not over. And we can never afford to sit back and think, oh, look at all the things God's done, all the blessings. I count before the Lord. But um, that is no assurance. There's plenty of room and opportunity to fail. Mm -hmm. And anyways, uh, we see that generation die over these 40 years. And when we come to the end of the book, we're 1,820 people fewer than we were before. Because not only were there deaths, but there are also births as well. There I mean, were it, births. It was, yes. It was, yeah, of, it course. Was a, right, of course. Yeah, that generation dies and the young generation grows up and takes their mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. But this number, 1,820, is a fascinating number because it is the number of God's name, which is 26, multiplied times 70, which is a number of perfection and completion. So it's almost as if God is saying, listen, your numbers are fewer. You've been through a, through a rough time. A lot of people have died. But I am smack in the middle of it all. Mm -hmm. And even though your numbers are fewer, this new generation had greater faith, much greater faith than the first generation that came out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a number of times in Scripture where we find something being reduced, but God's glory and presence in it being greater. We were talking a moment ago about Solomon's temple. It's so beautiful and glorious. But when it was almost completely destroyed, the Nehemiah and Ezra come back and restore it. People cried because it just didn't look like the temple before. Mm -hmm. And uh, the scriptures tell us its, its size was smaller, but its glory was greater. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's almost as if the smaller something is, the more God can use it. I agree. And, and I, love, I love looking at the numbers in, 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 the, in how they can... I don't know, just bring out a little bit more beauty mm -hmm. and and depth to it. It isn't it isn't something to to focus on in and of itself, mm -hmm. but no. the, the degree the degree to which in the numbers and the gematria or whatever, we can see uh, yeah. some some affirming truth 
And you see God's it's, hand. In, there's not yeah, chance. Oh, yeah. It's not just right. this and is it's how many it happen to be. Yeah, it, not it, just a number. There's there is something there for yes. sure. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So there's so uh, there is uh, the thought that taking a census. So it, it, in general, taking a census is something that is uh, involves risk and yeah. and divine displeasure. Yes, right. Absolutely. Um, because they, they can represent the principle that there is strength in numbers, right? Yeah. We can rely on our own strength, uh, the strength mm -hmm. of our community, of our congregation, of our nation, of our army, of our economy, right. because of the numbers, right? Yes. But in, the, in these instances, when God is seeking to count his people, mm -hmm. it is a, an act of love. Uh, and right. this is something that, that Rashi brings out mm -hmm. um, in his uh, commentary on it. And that he's, he's counting them as a, as a parent would after some very significant times mm -hmm. in the history of Israel where there's loss of life, right? Yes. It's like, okay, you know, picture uh, a parent or a teacher or, or someone going with kids, stopping every once in a while just to count. One, two, three, two, three. okay, they're yes. all here. Like all there here. Wor there's right. worry, there's care involved yes. with it. Um, so there's, there's, and he's do, he does this frequently. He counts mm -hmm. them frequently. That's exactly there's right. The tw there's two times in Exodus, Exodus 12, uh, when they left Egypt, Exodus 38, after the sin of the golden calf mm -hmm. and some of the sinners had died, and then twice here in Numbers, yes. where there was also, when he, he's, he is uh, resting with his presence among them, mm -hmm. and then also at the end of 24, as you yeah. stated. So there's... There's the there's the 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 idea the principle we need to, to consider that that strength is not in numbers That's it is right. not in our might it is not in our strength it is not in our numbers but it is in God's spirit yeah. as uh, is stated in Zechariah four six not by might nor by strength but by my ruach says the Lord that is essentially the new social order right right that that's the way we are to do things yes um, similarly in um, in Judges 7, 1 through 8, God commands Gideon mm -hmm. uh, to wage war against the Midianites with what will end up being how many people? <laughs> Not many. Not many. Yeah, three, no. 300 men, yes. right? 300 men. It's start, starting off with, what was it, 10,000? He had yes, 10,000 to start with, yes. thousands to start with, but he ended up with 300 men and was able to be victorious. Yeah. Not because of the numbers, yeah. but because of God's yeah. God's might, God's yeah. power, and His Spirit. And if I recall in that story, there's a place where God says, "You've got too many. I can't use that many. I need a fewer right. men to come." Yeah. And uh, that's how God is. He's the God of small things. One of the principles I've discovered in history and in the Scriptures is the more a thing is invested in the physical, so it's physically big the less it's invested in the spiritual. But when something is small, it's not invested in physicality. That means it's invested in spirituality. And so when you look at the miracles God performs throughout the scriptures, it's always little acts, small things that he uses to accomplish great things. And um, I, I think maybe that's where Tolkien got the whole di idea of using a, a halfling, a hobbit to basically mm. save the world, right. you know, he uses small things. And, um, and Paul says, I mean, look at your calling. Not many mighty, not many noble, not many, you know, wise in the flesh, and, you know, people of renown. God uses small things, the insignificant things to accomplish his will mm -hmm. and to bring to nothing the things that are. So uh, this is who our God is. He wants, he uses small things done right. And the danger too, there's a there's a discipline we could we could develop to recognize when it is we're starting to think about ourselves as yeah. too big. Mm -hmm. Recognize when we're starting to think of our family or our community or our teams or whoever as too big and mm -hmm. too powerful or or, yeah. uh, or or the agents of our own blessing. Right. Yeah. Like we we need to develop the discipline to. Remember that that's in smallness. Yeah. That is where God brings the blessing, where He that's brings right. victory. That's right. Um, which is, I guess, is that just humility? Or no, well, it's the principle of the cross. I know that. Yeah. Who would have thought that a, a stonemason who lived two thousand years ago 
um, never wrote a book, and um, you know, he, he was a teacher, and he dies as a criminal on a cross. And God has used that where we base a whole calendar on when he died and when he rose again. I mean, mm -hmm. he changed the world. Mm -hmm. uh, God uses these small things. You know, we tend to think that if we want to kill a giant, we need a bigger giant. And God says, no, you need a David. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has always been the way it works. David and a well-placed pebble. And a well-placed stone, yeah. 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 Mm. That's it. One more interesting thing about the how the census was was taken um, and that the, those who were entrusted with the task lifted the head. Yes. Right, so the, the, the word there is to lift the head. And what that, that, what that kind of pictures is taking into account, perhaps, the, the mindset of the person mm -hmm. counting, yeah. right? Because right. there, there's, a, there's the, the tendency or the temptation to just be like one, two, three, four, two, three, right? Yeah. Just, just as, as objects, as yes. people, as, as whatever. Not even individuals, but yeah. just like here's a group and a group is comprised of this many parts. Lifting the head, I think, pictures a very personal connection between yes. the person doing the counting mm -hmm. and the person being counted. Yes. It, is, it is a face-to-face, -face, lifting the head, uh, right. lifting of the spirit, and encouraging, mm -hmm. making them feel connected, yes. and making them feel that they belong in that body. Right. So that it, it isn't so much, it isn't just that that person is encouraged, but the person doing the counting Absolutely. understands yeah. that it isn't, that a crowd isn't, a, isn't one thing. That's it right. is many, many people, That's right. many souls. And each soul, as we've learned before, is like a universe in and yes. of itself. So making that connection, bringing that yeah. spirit into the whole process so yeah. that no one is under any delusion yeah. <laughs> that, that it's just yeah. people um, and, and, that, and that we are stronger because we're many. And that's, that's where we get the name of the Torah portion, Naso. It's Naso et Rosh, lift the mm -hmm. head. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we don't count kippahs, we count faces. And you have to, you know, look at the face. I, I think this is a, and you now becoming the new congregational minister, Beth the Kuh, your focus can't be on growing the congregation because that you, you're not noticing the faces. It's growing the souls. Mm -hmm. And uh, that needs to always be the focus. Grow the souls. The congregation will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. and, um, but we know the tragedies that we've heard and read over the years of people who are focused ne merely on the numbers. Mm -hmm. And people got ground up in the machine. People got lost yeah. in the machine. And it was tragic. Well, I grew up, I grew up in, a, in a denomination as many people, I'm sure, yeah. uh, who may be listening have, where on the side of, at the front of the building, at the front of the sanctuary, yeah. there was a, a plaque yeah. on the wall. You know what I'm going to say? The attendance. The, the attendance. And last the Sunday, maybe the Sunday before, and the offering. Uh, and then also on the same board mm -hmm. was like the, the number of the songs you were going to be singing, like song, you yeah, know, right. hymn number 406 or whatever. It was like, yeah. like this strange uh, accounting yeah. on the wall there. And... Where I was, it was it was so distracting because there was the the, the minister yeah. who was preaching from God's word, and then there were the numbers. Yeah. Like they were competing messages. Yes. Like here we should we should rely on his faith and mercy and, yeah. and his spirit and his might, but also here here are some numbers we need yeah. to keep remembering. And yes. when the numbers went up, we all felt good. Yeah. But when the numbers were down, even Girl, if the message yeah. was positive. Yeah. We were like, oh, oh no! Like yeah. it was just, it was a oh, I odd. Those. It was a strange, strange custom. Oh, I remember this, and they were always kind of round at the top. <laughs> yeah. I oh. remember a cover. Most people aren't old enough to remember uh, Last Days Ministries. I think it was called. Um, that was big back in the early '70s. But on the cover of one of their magazines, they showed that old Doré engraving of Moses with the tablets. The people are all down the bottom. He's getting ready to throw them down. But instead of the Ten Commandments, he had that with the attendance and the yeah, offering right. on him. And he's straight and ready to throw him down. And uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> there was a real yeah. message there. It's like, don't put a scoreboard on your church yeah. or in your synagogue. Even, Quit even keeping if, score. Even if you, 
if I remember back, I'm sure that it was said, this is how, this is us keeping track of how God is blessing us, yeah. right? Even if that was the spirit behind it, yeah. it's still just, it's so, it's so distracting. Yeah. And, oh. and, and when I, and growing up, the numbers tended to go down yeah. more often than they went up. Yeah. And to see that and be staring at it oh. was ill-advised. Yes, <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but that's flashback there. So <laughs> anyway, moving on. <clears throat> we're, we're showing our age when we do this. You know that, don't you? Um, I mean, you're almost as old I, as me now oh, when you start talking about that I guess I mean, it's all relative, stuff. right? Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> so tribes. 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 Let's talk about the tribes. Talk about tribes. You looked yeah, let up me, some let things me, on the Let tribes. me share something interesting. So, I don't, and I don't like that word tribes. No. Even yeah. though Judaism uses the word tribes, it mm -hmm. sounds primitive to me and... But anyways. There's also a stigma too these days about yeah. you know tribalism, yeah. like, like all that kind of stuff. But but actually there's value in associating with our tribes. Yes. But we'll just call it something else. We'll, we'll, we'll have to use tribes for now. But um, so I, w I looked up the origin etymology of the word tribe uh, as opposed to uh, the Hebrew word mate, which is used here in the passage. Tribe comes from the Latin tribus which is a division of Roman people, right? Okay. As, a, as a concept, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, that is a taking a total, a totality, and dividing it up, right? Mate comes from the root uh, nata, I believe, mm -hmm. that means to stretch out, to extend, yes. uh, to spread, or to branch right. off. Um, and the staff is, is, a, is an identifier of who the leader is. So yes. a tribe or a mate is a group of people who is led by a person holding right. the mate, right? So it's, right. it is a center point. Tribe, a division of a total number. So you're looking on the, on the boundary of the total. But mate is starting from a point and going out, extending out. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a very different mindset going on with how we're mm -hmm. accounting these things. Yeah. In the Hebrew, it is limitless how, how right. far we can extend out, how yeah. generations and generations can keep growing yes. and growing. And we as believers in Yeshua can be grafted in and be, mm -hmm. be an extension and keep spreading, right? Absolutely. But yes. tribe, this, this very Greek mm -hmm. and Latin way of thinking is taking a fixed number and dividing it up. Right. right. So, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I don't know if is. there's any practical value in that, but yeah. just, just interesting how that, how in the Hebrew it is centered on a point, on a staff, on a piece mm -hmm. of wood, right. Right? And, and going out from there. I thought it was interesting. So yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah it, it, of course, the tribes of Israel are based on their, uh, the, their father's lineage, and they all go back to the 12 sons of Jacob. And um, so you know, just like you have siblings and I have a sibling, siblings aren't necessarily all very much alike. They'll have certain similarities and then vast differences between them. And um, so if you have 12 sons, those sons each are going to have some very individual characteristics and those can be passed down. Mm -hmm. There'll be variations in there, but um, you, you know good and well that those who descended from the tribe of Reuben are going to have things that are distinctly different from those who, do, who descended from the tribe of, say, Gad or, um, or Benjamin. In fact, Benjamin and Reuben had different mothers, same father. So um, the, the encampments were according to your, your father's lineage. So you were with close relatives. Mm -hmm but you realize you're also part of something much bigger. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to Father Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. You come from that one covenantal starting point, mm -hmm. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, um, the relationships between the tribes is, is what is really being talked about mm -hmm. in this portion. Yes. I think that this portion is about um, maintaining uh, a sense of uh, recognition and respect, and um, and, and sustaining peace mm -hmm. among siblings, yes. right? Because yes. God loves for his for Absolutely. His children to get along, mm -hmm. and because they're so different, they yeah. they inherit all types of things, yes. including 
rivalries or right. or grudges or, or mm -hmm. things that just that humans just tend to do. That's right. right. That's right. And and because of that, I think that the the, the structure is valuable, mm -hmm. right? And I, I want to quote something here sure. from um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. This is his book, uh, Covenant and Conversation on Great Numbers. Book. Uh, it says here. It seems that the Torah is telling us something compelling and fundamental, relevant not just then, but still today. Torah, the Torah conceives of politics and identity from the ground up, not from the top down. It is not the ruler, emperor, or king who represents authority and imposes it on the population. To the contrary, the Torah takes us through the slow growth of Israel as an entity beginning with one couple, Abraham and Sarah, who become a family, mm -hmm. then an extended family, then a tribe, than a series of tribes. They are forged into a single nation negatively by the experience of oppression in Egypt and positively by redemption and by the covenant they made with God at Mount Sinai. But those early structures, family, clan, tribe, mm -hmm. remain important in the body politic, not just at the beginning, but throughout. Yes. So there's, so the, the lesson here is we, we abandon our tribes at our own expense. Yes. We must we must understand the value of these Absolutely. different structures. Yes. The family, uh, husband and wife, mm -hmm. father and children, uh, mother, uh, cousins, yes. uh, all these things we have to we have to keep yeah. all of it together and in order for all of this to to work and for yes. us to get along and for us to be for us to actually be mm -hmm. united. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I, I do as I get older, I spend more time sitting on the porch just looking at nature. And I'm really becoming an old man. And I used to kind of make fun of old men sitting on the front porch. But you know what? It's a very rich time. And as I look out at nature, it seems, on the one hand, utterly chaotic. Uh, you see just things growing everywhere, weeds and plants we want, plants we don't want, trees. You see animals and bugs and birds and everything else. It just seems like this wild, just explosion of life, utter chaos, and it's wonderful, it's beautiful. But on the other hand, if you look at it another way, everything's in perfect order. The animals cooperate with one another, the trees and the other plants, there's a cooperation. And as you get down and you look at how the cells are made up and the limbs and the bark and everything, it's, there's this perfect balance and order going on. Mm. So on the one hand, it appears chaotic and beautiful. Other hand, it's completely orderly and equally as beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, this is part about our, uh, of our human world. And I know when we get together as a, as a congregation for corporate services, it can look very chaotic, <laughs> be, but it's beautiful, it's wonderful. But there's an order there. Everybody knows which family they belong to, who they're accountable to. And um, it, it's an amazing thing. You see the mm -hmm. same balance. And uh, it, we see the same balance with Israel. But when they begin to step out of their order, things get ugly. Mm -hmm. And we will find out a lot about that in the book of Numbers. As today, too. So, so the, the, you know, some of the buzzwords these days yeah. is identity, politics, yeah. or, or things like that, yeah. where it isn't so much about... The Torah isn't anti-politics, hmm. right? It is. It isn't anti these things. It's just putting no. them in a proper framework, yeah. right? Do it right. There, there are there are divine ways in which to yeah. identify. Yes. When we get out of those divine ways of identification, mm -hmm. of association, and right. and categorization, then it is chaos. It is. Right. It is. And these days, it's you know, it's 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 either we're all one human race. And there's no individuality, yeah. or we're only individuals, yeah. and there's nothing else, yeah. which is like the two extremes. Right? And even throw out gender for that matter. And, right, yeah. and, and it's it's all about it's all about how how you how you are associating or identifying your I don't I don't know what the word is, but you, you know what I'm saying. Right? Yeah. Like that, like there's there's a good way to recognize where we belong mm -hmm. and it's laid out here that's right. and that's why we that's why later on when the the leaders are coming from the tribes to give an offering mm -hmm. they're giving the same offering yeah. exact same offering 
but, but each, each tribe listed is listed way. and recognized and respected yes. as a tribe. It yes. wasn't just, it could have been, and all of Israel yeah. gave how gave many this. ever thousand spoons and, yeah. and gold yeah. bits right. and livestock. No, it divided it up, seemingly unnecessary, yeah. but the, the value is in recognizing yeah. the, the, the way in which it's divided up. And there's blessing there. I, I always, you know, I have to confess, when I come to that chapter, was it chapter 7, mm -hmm. I think, when yep. they list all that? It's like, oh, my goodness, this is so boring. Especially you read in Hebrew. It's like, oh, I just read that. And you read it again. And again, 12 times you read it through. And uh, it, it's, it's like, what are you trying to teach? What is the thing you're trying to teach? Mm -hmm. For God to devote so much space to something, you could just say, this is what each tribe gave. Multiply by 12 to get the total. <laughs> you get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have to think, well, there has to be something internal, something spiritual that was very unique and different about each of these gifts. Mm -hmm. And so, again, let's take Reuben. Reuben, he brings and lists everything he brings. Um, and then the leader of Judah, he, he brings whatever he brings, whatever order it was in. Well, what was in Reuben's heart when he, the leader of Reuben's tribe, when he brought this? What was in the heart of the leader of Judah's tribe, or Benjamin's tribe, or Ephraim's tribe. Mm -hmm. We're not told that, but there had to be a personal, unique devotion to God that each one brought that identified with his personality and his character. So the externals were the same, but the internals could have been vastly different because each tribe had a relationship with God that was different from every other tribe's. Mm -hmm. What was also, we, we can presume, different was what these dishes and, and uh, uh, there were... They might have been shaped differently. They might have been shaped differently or, yeah. had, or had different ornamentation or, sure. or, or, or size. I mean, yeah. it, like, the, there, was, there was uniformity. Mm -hmm. And, and here, here's maybe another important point. Uniformity is not unity. We no, know this. not at all. But uniformity is an, an important tool in mm -hmm. bringing about unity. Yes. Here in this, where each individual tribe, mm -hmm. distinct tribe, yeah. was bringing the same offering mm -hmm. uh, or the same number of offerings to one, the one yes. God. Yes. In the tabernacle, all the things that were, it, the tabernacle is one tabernacle right. made of distinct pieces mm -hmm. that were made by distinct people mm -hmm. and with using materials uh, uh, contributed by distinct tribes. Yes. So there's distinction and uniformity. All like came together, all that though. coming together, yeah. the, the, the uniformity is kind of what weaves yes. these distinct groups together yeah. in order for there to be unity. Yeah. Does that, yes, that make absolutely. sense? Yeah. And as you're talking, I keep picturing the New Jerusalem because the New Jerusalem, uh, this amazing city, which is the bride of Messiah. In the last two chapters of Revelation, it's described, and the wall around the city has three gates on the south, three on the north, three on the east, three on the west, and the gates are named after the 12 tribes. And when you look at how the tabernacle was set up, but you had three tribes in one camp on the east, you had three tribes in the camp on the south, three tribes in the camp on the west, three tribes in the camp on the north. You have the same layout, three on each side. Mm -hmm. And so, again, there's unity. Uniformity. And there's some uniformity, yeah. but each had a different name. Mm -hmm. And it all came together to make one thing. And uh, I, I've shared before teaching years ago, I forget how long, but... I kept imagining, you know, Reuben was, um, was down here on the south, the camp of Reuben, and there were three tribes in that camp, Reuben, and then uh, there was uh, Simeon and Gad. So that made the camp of Reuben. And up here on the north is the camp of Dan. And with, I should make it all cap, shouldn't I, to keep it? Uniform. Keep uniform, yes. Yeah, you're learning. So, <laughs> yeah. And with Dan was Asher and Naphtali. And I, so I picture somebody from Dan's camp and somebody from Reuben's camp having a conversation. And, um, uh, and somebody from Reuben's camp talks about, oh, I just love looking north to see the tabernacle, to see the smoke. From the... And Dan says, no, you don't look north to see the tabernacle, you look south. 
And somebody on, on Judah's side could say, oh, I love watching at the sunset, watching the sunset over the, over the tabernacle. But somebody over here in Ephraim's side, oh, I love watching the sun rise over the tabernacle because he's looking east. And they can start arguing. Wait a minute, no, the sun rises over the tabernacle. No, it doesn't. It sets over the tabernacle. And what and they're this is doing... How, this is how the, the how first denomination denominational start, yes. splits began, was right here. <laughs> so they're all looking... We worship looking, the God uh, who, is, who yes. ri the sun rises to the north. Yep. They're all looking at the same thing, <laughs> from a, but from a different viewpoint. Yep. And, um, and so if someone has a different viewpoint, it doesn't mean they're wrong. It, mean they may, it means they may be seeing an aspect of the same thing that you don't see. You need their viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating that God put them all around the tabernacle the way he did. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it really comes back to the value of some uniformity. Yes. Right, like mm -hmm. something, some things we all agree on, some, some rules, yeah. some set parameters. Like, yeah. here are the things we're, gonna, we're all going to do together. Yes. We're not going to do everything together because yeah. that that will that will just drive yeah. chaos. That that'll that'll lead to competition right. and rivalry. But we have to have some. If we have no mm -hmm. uniform things, we have no. no things in common. Then similarly, we yeah. tend to have tension, and yes. and it's just it's beautiful I mean, trying to find that balance. Yeah. I remember talking to someone who was raised in synagogue, and. Um, of course, in the synagogue, the men would all sit here, and the women would be in the balcony. And the men would always have a tallit on, have a kippah and a tallit, a white tallit. And, um, and this, this woman, this Jewish woman I'm talking to, uh, was described in the synagogue. She says, when you look down, you see the men. You can't dis make any distinctions. Mm. They all, when they're praying, they all look the same. They could all be wearing different clothes underneath, but when they put the tallit on, they have the keep and the tallit, they all look the same. Mm -hmm. And in our worship, worship is something, the word chava, the word for worship, means to be prostrate, to go face down. You get yourself out of the way. You don't block anyone else's view of God. That's what the word means. We can't all just get on our face in a, in a building. Uh, but it means I don't draw attention to myself. And there's certain people and who the things think, about you that are recognizable as unique yeah. are hidden as well. They it's are. harder to recognize someone from yes. the, the back of their head. Yes. Well, m me, I'm, I might be a little, <laughs> but but they're also doing that too. They're yes. they're, they're hiding their distinctness because it's not about head. me at all. Yes. I shouldn't be seen or noticed at all. It's all about him. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> when it comes to this, this worship is utterly spiritual. And when we're engaged in this spiritual activity as a group, there should be no one drawing attention to themselves. Mm -hmm. All the attention goes to him. Later, when we have a study and a discussion, you'll have an opinion, I'll have an opinion, I'll have an insight you share, you have an insight. Then we bring our differences together. And there are places to celebrate the differences. Worship is not that place. Mm -hmm. In worship, we recognize we all have the same Holy Spirit, the same spiritual core, the same Savior, and there's not room for individual differences. Mm -hmm. We worship as a body doing one thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but later, do we celebrate the differences because they all, those also come from God. I think it's interesting how the camps were arranged then. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were all facing the tabernacle, the tabernacle. where, where God's the presence dwelt. Yes. But they were also facing each other. They were facing each other. As if to say, you know, okay, kids, yeah. look to me. <laughs> I will be your strength. Yes, but you're right. also looking. You're looking past me or through me to your brothers. That's right. Because we, you need each other. Yes. As much as you need me. Absolutely, so true. Another thing, when they looked at each other, you know, the there were three families of the Levites, and you had Kehote on the south. There's so this is a very small group. And then you had Merari, I think, was up on the, uh, on the north, yeah, Merari. And because I've written so, so, I'll clean this up before it goes online. But Gershon then was camped here, just right to the west of the tabernacle. And so you have Moses and Aaron, they're camped out here, right at the entrance of the tabernacle. 
but then you have Kehoe, which is the family of Aaron and Moses on the south, and Merari on the north, and Gershon on the west. And then you have the large camps uh, of Judah, Reuben, and Ephraim, with the, each one having three tribes. So it's like when Reuben looks at the tabernacle, they have to look through Kehoe to see it. Mm -hmm. And when Dan looks at the tabernacle, he has to look through Merari to see it. They look through these close servants of God that God has assigned to move the tabernacle, to, to take it apart, to put it back up, to carry all the pieces. And uh, the, the ones God has assigned to be the attendees, the attendants, the servants of the tabernacle, the others have to see the tabernacle through their work. Mm -hmm. And we need to recognize the work of those mm -hmm. who serve God. It's uh, very important. So I don't know how we got off on that tangent, but no, there it we are. doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, isn't that a nice circle, though? Uh, so that's, a right. that that's a perfect circle. That is a perfect circle. Good. Okay. I'm, I'm easily distracted. <laughs> it's all right. So. It got, I want to mention one other thing it's, that struck me this week when I was reading. When you get to chapter, I think it's chapter 16. Don't hold me to that. But I think it's chapter 16. We read the horrible account of Korah. Mm -hmm who is from the tribe of Quixote. He was a Levite. He was part of the Quixote family, which was of the three Levitical families, Quixote was privileged to carry the ark, carry the menorah, carry the, the furniture of the tabernacle. They carried it on staves. It was a, a very highly privileged job. And, but Cora decided, I want a little bit more responsibility. I want a little bit more authority. And it says there in chapter 16 that he got some of the men of Reuben to join him. Now it's interesting, Quixote and Reuben were camped right here next to each other. It doesn't say Korah got people from Dan or Ephraim or Judah. But Korah exerted an evil influence upon the people he was close to. Mm. And I'm reminded of... Uh, that one verse in Perkea vote that we should distance ourselves from an evil neighbor and, um, and we should shun a wicked companion. Mm -hmm. And we need to be very careful because we may think we are immune to evil influences because we're so holy. We're not. And, um, and so the men of Reuben should have distanced themselves from the evil Korah. Mm -hmm. and, but because many of them didn't, when the ground opened up, you know, there was a, a lot of death, a lot of damage. So why, why did Korah do that? Ah, we'll get to that in chapter 16. Oh. Stay tuned. <sighs> this will keep him coming back. That's a teaser, right? <laughs> right. Okay, all right. Well, here's a question. What, what, uh, what tribe are we? Oh, what tribe are we? And does it matter? Um... <clears throat> Yeah, come back. We'll check back, <laughs> check back in with us on that one. Um, well, you know when the Israelites came out of Egypt, it says they came out of a, a great mixed multitude. In fact, mm -hmm. the Jewish people might have been outnumbered by the number of Gentiles who joined them. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But after that, basically, Gentiles mixed in with the, um, the Jews are hardly even mentioned. They were just absorbed into the tribes. So I think to answer the question, we have to answer it with a spiritual answer, because physically we're not part of any of the mm -hmm. tribes. Um, I mean, I don't have any Jewish blood in me at all, so I'm not a part of any of the 12 tribes. But as you study the tribes, each tribe did have a personality. And you find these described at the end of Genesis when Jacob prophesies over each of his 12 sons, and again at the end of Deuteronomy when Moses prophesies over each of the tribes. And there are many similarities between the prophecy of Jacob and the prophecy of Moses concerning these 12 individual beings. And um, <clears throat> so I can look at that and I can begin, and with input from others, begin to identify which of those is my personality. Mm. So which one do I reflect spiritually? Mm. And um, you know when it says that each man in his own camp, each man in his own banner, it was a degult, it was an image, it was a big banner, and each tribe had its own image that represented that tribe. And these are taken from the prophecies of Jacob and Moses. Um, 
So it's like, which one of those most closely symbolizes and represents me? Mm -hmm. So it's really a, a worthwhile study. There's some great <laughs> books out just on the 12 tribes and their, their personalities. So that's the best way I know to answer your question. Okay, yeah. So. I, think, uh, yeah I, I think that, especially after understanding the, the value of, of these delineations, yeah. right? Yeah. It's good. It's good to to, to find out, yes. to figure it out, and to to know yeah. how, where you where you should identify or associate yourself. Is that yeah. you yes. know not mm -hmm. not not to go too far with it, mm -hmm. but just to say you know how who am I? Right. Right. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. So. I agreed totally. Well, uh, what do you have next on your? Let's, um. So let's go to the priestly blessing. Yes. Yeah. Let's, I think let's that's do a great that. idea. Okay. So one thing that struck me this week was, um, and where is that? It is the last line of the priestly blessing, which we don't actually say um, when we recite it. Do you know where, where, is, where is the priestly blessing oh. in here? <clears throat> it's in um, chapter oh, there six. it is. Okay. Okay. Chapter 6, verse uh, 22. I'll just read through mm -hmm. 22 to, through 27. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you, Aaron and his sons, shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance on you and give you peace. And this is the, this is the, the verse mm. that struck me. So they, the sons of Aaron and Aaron, shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I will bless them. Mm. Yes. So Aaron and his sons have uh, no power in and of themselves to bring yeah. blessing to the people. Because mm -hmm. they're asking God to bless them. Right. Yeah. But God is using them mm -hmm. to bring his blessing. Yes. One thing I, I find interesting about that there, that instruction, and the, the status of, of the Levites mm -hmm. as a tribe, mm -hmm. they had no share in the land. They were unique mm -hmm. in that yeah. they had no other vocation. They had no way to, to provide right. for themselves. They were, they were uh, dependent on the, the wealth and prosperity yes. of all the other tribes. That's right. And this, I think, is by design. I think this is a, an instance where God is, is he's saying, okay, look, you're all human people, mm -hmm. and you have a certain nature about you that we're working on. You're called to be better than your nature, but we're going to start mm -hmm. with where you are, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and God is taking advantage of the, the Levites' self-interest. They, they have it in mm -hmm. their best interest to be yes. the conduits of God's blessing yes. to the other tribes so, so that those tribes back would come back to yeah. them and bless them. Because who well. says the blessing over the Levites? The sons of Aaron. Yeah. They're the ones saying the blessing. Who says it over them? Well, the people, mm -hmm. um, the, the fruitfulness and the blessings of the people flow back to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's, I don't know, it's, this is a holy thing. <laughs> it's a sure holy is. thing, but it requires, yeah. maybe not requires, but it, it, it at least recognizes the human tendency mm -hmm. to, be, to have self interest. Because yes. the, the yes. Levites, they, they weren't priests because they were holier or more righteous, mm -hmm. it was birthright. Mm -hmm. the, they were Levites because they were Levites. Yes. Right? So well, they're, they're, but they're, this, this goes back to our previous question. How did they? How were they chosen as the priestly tribe? Mm -hmm. It's because there's something in their personality. They were a bloodthirsty group. Because remember, Levi and Simeon are the ones who went in and slaughtered mm -hmm. the entire city of um, of um, begins with an S. Uh, there, <laughs> I can't believe my mind is. Shechem. Thank you, David. Shechem, Shechem, Shechem. and. Um, and they went and just slaughtered them. And Judah, uh, uh, Jacob just really chewed them out. And then when he did the blessing over them on his deathbed, he said, may God scatter you through Israel. And so Simeon didn't receive an inheritance either. They were scattered through the tribe of Judah. But when it came to the golden calf, 
Levi didn't participate in that. They didn't participate in the in the, the revelry and everything else that went with it and the idol worship. They stood apart. So Moses called them to go in and be God's instrument to kill the ones who were sinning. Mm -hmm. And because of that, that righteous act, they were then made the priestly tribe. Because mm -hmm. they and and so it's interesting. So they may, they, may have inherited, they may have inherited those traits. Yes. But they weren't necessarily... But they learned from that negative right. trait and they, with, mm -hmm. they they stood back from it. Mm -hmm. And then God used that trait. Mm -hmm. It's like the question, what if you're born with a bloodthirsty na nature? Become a surgeon. Okay, <laughs> use it for good, right? <laughs> and so um, Levi did not participate in the, in the idol worship. And so God elevates them to this wonderful place because they exercised self-control over their own tendencies. Mm -hmm. They were not dominated but by they weren't their personality. Perfect. Oh, not right. by a long and shot. I, th I think that, that's the point, is that, yes. is that as we move from our, nat our nature to our yeah. supernature, mm -hmm. th there's a spectrum. Right? And even right. amongst the Levites, they were all in probably different places yeah. in that process of their own spiritual growth and maturity. Yeah. But, but right. recognizing, okay, you know, you're, you're, if, if for no other reason, yeah. pray a blessing over all of Israel because it'll serve you. That's right. Right. I mean, that's like, right. just do it because that's, I mean, yes. if you're, if, if it's, if it's going to be, if it's going to be one reason, yeah. that, that's not the worst yeah. reason. Does that make sense? Yes. Like it's, 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 it's gracious. Exactly. It's merciful too. Um, and, and, I, that's, I think and that's too, beautiful. The Levites by nature would have been great warriors. I mean, that's what they did in Shechem, mm -hmm. but they never went to battle. Mm -hmm. That they never did because God made them priests. So that thing in their nature, they made great warriors. God says, no, uh, you're, you're not going to go out to war like the, all the other tribes do. Mm -hmm. it, it, I don't know. It's just fascinating to it, me. It's, it's so, yeah, it's so, so much cool. To learn. So cool. Did you want me to go through a little bit of the mathematics of this blessing? Uh, sh uh, yes, but just, just a minute. I want to I touch, too, on, and David and I were talking about this yesterday, and... and Talking a little bit more about the uh, the Levites, mm -hmm. they they had cities, mm -hmm. yeah. but not but not territories, right? right? Um, and you've spoken too about how they're kind of a connective tissue, mm -hmm. right? So Levi they, Levi means to to connect, yes. right? So so there was so basically the boundaries of these these uh, places in the land. Were just messy, right? Mm -hmm. they, they were, they weren't straight. Yeah. Uh, they, they were, they overlapped. There were cities from one tribe yeah. in another yeah. tribe's land. Like there was just this very strange, very chaotic. Look it yeah. wasn't, um, it wasn't a very two-dimensional way of organizing, mm -hmm. but much more three-dimensional, mm -hmm. right? So yes. if you took, if you took the map of the territory, and then made it into a something three-dimensional, mm -hmm. there'd be a way to connect. The cities with the camps through mm -hmm. the center of it, which is that—that's just a, You're really a different losing way. You're me here, Tim. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is where I'm at. Um, but, no, I, I'm, I'm but it's more—it's—it's—it isn't a logical way of, yeah. of organizing people yeah. by tribes. But that's the point. Yes. And it's because not right in our own it's eyes. not right in our own eyes. No. And because the people had to intermingle, mm -hmm. again, the relationships between the siblings. Mm -hmm stays healthy yes they're yes. not they're not refusing to step across a right. line they have to in mm -hmm. order to get to part of their territory yes they have to engage with all the other yes. tribes for different uh, you know means of mm -hmm. of commerce or, or three education three times or, a year to come to jerusalem and then come together yes. pass through one another's territories right yeah. so so there's this there's this there's a beauty in this complicated mm -hmm. and complex way in yes. which Absolutely. People are arranged and organized. Yeah. And when we, in our day and age, try to oversimplify it and say, you are this, mm -hmm. I am that, yeah. we get into trouble. It, oh, yeah. It's just, it, it doesn't take into account just the complexity and the beauty of, no. of God's creation. It takes humility to do that, to blend with others. So it has to be humility for you to connect, your soul to connect with another soul. Mm -hmm. There just has to be. Yeah, Yeah. so let's, let's talk about yeah. the, the blessing um, itself. The, of course, I didn't put it in English, but these are the three lines of the, the mate that we uh, speak that you 
pray over people at the end of the prayer service. And the first line, Yivarekha Adonai Vayishmarekha, may he bless you, Adonai, and there is God's name in red, Vayishmarekha, and may he guard you. That first line contains three words. So let's count the words here. I, again, it's kind of like the, the census, the beginning of numbers, the census at the end. There's a balance, there's a mathematical beauty to it. So here we have three words in the first line. Ye'er Adonai panoi v'lecha v'yokoneka, may he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. There's that word chen, grace. So here we see five words. And then in the last line, Yisa Adonai panoi v'lecha v'yasim l'ka shalom. May he um, lift his face upon you. And that word yasa is where we get the word naso, lifting the head. May he raise his face upon you and give you shalom, peace. And here we see there are seven words. Three, five, seven. So each line, they grow, it grows by two words. Now, if we count the number of letters. I won't take time to count them here, but you can do it yourself. The first line has 15 letters. The second line has 20 letters. The third line has 25 letters. So again, we see this perfect symmetry, but this time the letters grow by five each time, 15, 20, 25. So the total number of words in the Aaronic benediction is 15 words. 15 is the number of God's abbreviated name, Yah, the first two letters of yud Hey vav Hey, And if we add up the number of letters in this blessing, we get 60. 60 equals the letter Samik. Samik means support. It means to support. And, uh, you know, we do, was it Psalm 145, where um, he, he supports those who've fallen, that verse starts with a summit because the word, first word there is mm. summek. He summeks mm. those who fall and straightens all the bent. And summek means to support, but it's also said to picture a signet ring. It's almost like this blessing is God's ring. Mm. The Sabbath is the ring that God has given us to wear as a sign that we're in covenant with Him. But this blessing that He blesses us with, as you said, is like His signet ring that says, I'm in covenant with you. I'm going to bless you. And, um, you know, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, but only 13 of those letters are used for this. So that means there are nine letters that are completely unused. 13 letters are used to, to create this amazing blessing. And what is 13 the number of? Well, it's the, it equals the number Echad, which means one. And it is also... It is also the numerical value of Ahava, which is the word for love. Because love, after all, is what makes us one. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's just some, to me, amazing, amazing things are built into this, this blessing. The last one is, you'll notice every, every word contains a yud. There we go, there's one, every, every word as you go through here until you get to the last two words, lecha shalom. So the letters used most in this is the letter yud, which is the, the smallest of all the letters. Um, not one yud or tagin will pass from the Torah till all is fulfilled. Yud is the most spiritual letters, but how many are there? 13 yuds. Again, it's, it's something that brings unity. It's an expression of God's love for us. And as we speak this over people, it's expression of our love for mm -hmm. them. And um, I know there are many other secrets built into this, but if you take the middle three words, the middle word of each line, you have Adonai, Panoiv, Elecha, God's face upon you, mm. okay? And if you take the middle three words of the middle line, it's the same thing. Adonai, Panoiv, Eleka. So, it, 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 again, there's this great, <laughs> this great harmony. Um, 
rabbis have said this represents three menorahs. Here's a, a three-branch menorah, a five-branch menorah, mm. seven-branch menorah. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, it's beautiful. No matter how you lay this out, you begin to see more and more how no human being could create this. Oh, yeah. Oh, so it's just so affirming. too yeah. perfect, too beautiful, too balanced. So here's something I read, um, and let me get your thought on it. The line, uh, in the second line, so after the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. So at, when I, as I've been getting familiar with this early on, I thought, well, this seems to be redundant. Mm -hmm. Make his face shine on you and then lift his countenance on you. So it's the same word, mm -hmm. right? It's... Uh, 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 alecha, alecha, mm -hmm. right? Face, countenance. Mm -hmm. uh, is it oh, yeah. just? Is it just? Is he really just hammering the point home? And what I what I heard uh, was that the first instance where his face is mentioned, the Lord make his face shine on you. Isn't not not? Don't picture it as his face shining on you. Mm -hmm. Picture it as. When other people see you, mm -hmm. they see his face shining on you. Mm, that's an interesting way to think of right? it. I hadn't thought of that. So it, I hadn't heard that. As if to say, and this, yeah. this kind of goes along with the last line of, of the passage, so they will invoke my name on the sons mm -hmm. of Israel. So my name will be on them, but also the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face be shining mm -hmm. on you and be gracious yes. to you. Like that, yeah. I like that. Yes. That's yeah. not enough to teach it as fact <laughs> that I like it, but that yeah. helps me to at least distinguish the two lines yeah, as right. being something a little different. Right? And also just to clarify, in our translations, we'll say face mm -hmm. in the second line, we say countenance in the third line, but they're the same word. Mm -hmm. um, they're just trying to make it sound better in English. Mm -hmm. right. But um, to me, as I've read this over the years, I always think the, the, the lines are in reverse order. It should be, may the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. She lifts his countenance on them. May he make his face shine on you. You can't make your face shine until you're pointing it at somebody, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then let him bless you and, mm -hmm. and keep you. Mm -hmm. That seems the right order. Mm -hmm. Start yeah. with the third line, then the second, then the first. Right. But that's not what it does. But you're wrong. I know. <laughs> but then I think it's one of those things where God's saying, I'm giving it to you from my viewpoint. But you're experiencing it from your viewpoint. Okay. So, um, and one last thing. It, it, you read in the scriptures where God lifts his face upon somebody, and it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. He's about to bring a, a hurt on them. Mm -hmm. And other places like this, he lifts his face and it's to bring blessing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why is it sometimes he, 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 he puts his face towards them and he's getting ready to wallop them? other times he's getting ready to really bless them and I start thinking as a parent you know my kids do something really good I just want to look at them just mm -hmm. love on them and smile at them but then other times when they do something it's like you know I give them the, the old stink eye and so I'm looking at them it's for a whole different reason <laughs> so um, so we find both of those in the scriptures as well Mm -hmm. It's like God says, don't make me look at you. Don't make me come over there. Mm -hmm. But then the worst of all is when he turns his face away from us. Mm -hmm. And uh, the light seemed to go out. He just like, I can't stand to look. I just can't, I just can't look at you right now. Yeah. And that is the saddest of all. That to me is the very saddest condition to be in. This is related, I think, to the, the task of the, of the census taker. Mm. And lifting the head, mm -hmm. right? And that there yes. is a so in the blessing there is uh, protection, um, peace, uh, protection, grace, and peace, mm -hmm. right? And 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 the face, like it's mm -hmm. it's all it's all wrapped up yes. in 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 the face, which is the most unique thing yes. about any individual is right. is the face. You recognize someone. If, if you put a mask on, it's, it's anyone's right. guess, right? Yeah. So, so the face is so important here. Absolutely. Um, but when, when, the, uh, when the countenance, the Lord lift up his countenance you and give you peace, mm -hmm. I've heard it said that that's, that, that is the, the, the vehicle by which the peace is given. Right? Mm -hmm. So if, if, I'm, if I'm up in front of people um, and I'm 
teaching or speaking or, or doing whatever, mm -hmm. right, in front of a crowd. Um, it's so important for me to find the faces yes. of the people who are smiling, people yes. who I know, who yeah. who will who just uh, mm -hmm. it's just a friendly, welcoming right. glance. It's like okay, oh, all right, exactly. and there's a peace that comes. Mm -hmm. Right. Similarly, uh, if I'm in a crowd of people and I see someone who I recognize, who I hope recognizes me, someone yeah. maybe. Uh, famous or some, yeah. someone that I highly respect, yeah. if they turn their countenance to me and acknowledge me, makes your day. It is, oh, it is a, yeah. there's a piece. It's like, oh, yes. okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're saying, I see you. But I see yeah. you. I yes. see, I, yes, exactly. I see you. And in seeing, if, if God sees me, that's saying, mm -hmm. I know you. God's saying, I know yeah. you. I know you. I've known you forever. Yeah. I know you now. Be at peace. Yes. It's, I love you. Yeah. And with the census taker lifting the head, mm -hmm. all of the individuals were passing by right. the person who was doing this. He lifted yeah. the head and I imagine yeah. said something encouraging or right. lifted their spirit, said, yes. I see you, I love yep. you, you are part of this mm -hmm. nation, a part Absolutely. of this family. And that is the way in which yeah. the counting took place. It, yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's face beautiful. to face. Yeah. You know, um, this kind of ties in with what you're saying, but this number 60, you know, we always think of six being the number of man, but there's 60 letters that make up this blessing. And, uh, but even that's an expression of God's love for us because traditionally the rabbis have always recognized this 60 as aligning with uh, the Song of Solomon and chapter 8, verse six no 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 that that one chapter three verses seven and eight it says behold it is the litter of solomon now who is solomon son of david you know when we think of yeshua son of david we think of david because he was like david in so many ways but we also have to think of solomon the son of david the king the glorious king mm. and his first coming yeshua is like david and his return he's like solomon and so we're looking for him to come. It says, Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are 60 mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh against terror by night. And the rabbis have always seen these 60 letters when they're pronounced. And like when a father says them over his children at the Sabbath table. It's like surrounding them with warriors, mm. and you're bringing God's presence into their lives. And it's a powerful image when you look at it that way. So it's not only that God sees us, but he says, I'm coming, and I'm bringing my warriors with me. You're safe. You're good. Mm -hmm. You don't have a thing to worry about. Mm -hmm. And we know spiritually he is with us, and uh, he surrounds us with his protection. So... Uh, Blessing is a beautiful thing. Yeah, I we like think to, it's just words, but it's a lot more no, no, than no. words. The the signet ring, so the the samic, mm -hmm. the signet ring. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that 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 it ties into, um, and you shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel. Mm -hmm. They're they're putting God's name on them, as yes. if with a signet ring, p putting yes. their his the seal Good on picture. his people. Yes. Like this is this is this is my. They're mine. Your mind. Mm -hmm. This this is from me. You are from me, yes. and you are to go out with the message. Um, and and yeah. though it, it reminded me too that that last word. This is the sign that we have been blessed with Aaron's blessing, mm -hmm. shalom. And one of the rabbis said that there's no. He put words in God's mouth, where as if God's saying there's no vessel that contains my blessings other than shalom. It's the one vessel contains all my blessings. And um, so Yeshua came and said that he came to bring peace into our lives. He's the Prince of Peace. And he wants to give us a peace that passes understanding. Because when you truly are experiencing God's blessings in your life, this is what happens right here. Mm -hmm. Shalom. Yeah. Shalom is something that we pray for. Mm -hmm but it's also something we have to work toward. And we have to protect. And it is all about mm -hmm. relationships. Yes. 
and that's and that's why I think this this passage, this mm -hmm. portion anyway, is about maintaining the peace between yeah. the fa in the family, uh, yeah. making sure tensions are are d diluted you know, yes. and dissolved, yeah. but maintaining peace. But it it requires effort. It does. Um, yeah. yeah. So. So. Well, I think. I hope people listen to this. I, I, yeah, yeah, if you if I, you're still I've watching, um, you win a prize. Uh. <laughs> if you fell asleep, wake up, wake up. It's it's time for the discussion questions. <laughs> Should we jump into the discussion questions? Sure. So, yeah. Okay. So look at the census in the first chapter of Numbers. Uh, which tribe was the largest? We discussed this, mm -hmm. and you have to think about this to get the right answer. How large was Joseph's tribe? Trick question. But do the math, and you'll, you'll figure out which is the largest of the 12 tribes. Compare the censuses of chapters 1 and 24. How can reduction bring blessing? Three, considering the sota. We didn't get to talk about the wayward mm -hmm. wife, the sota. In chapter 5, what parallels do you see with Exodus 32, verses 19 and 20? We'll tell you what those are. You can look them up. What is the difference between a Nazarite and a Nazarene? I find people all the time confused by that. And I was, too, until I figured it out. But uh, a lot of people don't know the difference. Nazarite, Nazarene. Yeshua was one, but he was not the other. And chapter 7, why are the gifts from each tribal leader listed when all the leaders brought identical items? So I think I've given something to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. Do you want to close this out in prayer? I would love to. Okay. Our Father and King, we thank you because you love to bless your family. You love to look on our, our faces. You love to lift our heads. And why you love us so much, it's not because of us. It's because you are love. It is your very nature. So, Father, help us to receive your love in a way that brings glory to you and to love you back in the way you deserve, and also to love our neighbor as ourself. Make us the people you want us to be, and I pray you bless each individual, each group mm -hmm. uh, around the world who listens to the words of this teaching, that there be something here that would feed their soul and spirit, that would inspire them, and that would uh, allow the light of your face to penetrate their minds and hearts a little more deeply. We praise you and thank you for this, and we commit this teaching to you and pray it would find pleasure in your sight. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.